welcome everybody who's viewing us live on Facebook. Welcome to the 2020 public reading of the HIV Writers Workshop. We usually call this event Write Out Loud um, because we like to let our voices heard loud. We have a wonderful group of writers to bring you their lovely literature today. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we all do together. It's a big insp inspiration for me. I can tell you that uh, this workshop started as the APLA Writers Workshop in 1990. It was started by Irene Borger and it has had a few incarnations. It is still currently being put on at APLA by Dan Nussbaum on Sunday afternoons. You can find out about that and also um, I came into the workshop in 97, um, recovering from full-blown AIDS. A friend of mine, Steve Smith, who is no longer with us, told me about the workshop and told me it would be really healthy for me, get me back into the world of the living. And I did, and it changed my life. And I like to keep that tradition going. And it's an honor for me to have been doing this for about 14 years now. I am very grateful to Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs for helping us Put this together. They've given us funding to do this for a number of years and we're really, really grateful for them. I'm also very grateful to Cedar sinai um, uh, Health Science Pavilion and their community education program. And they have given us big support. Unfortunately, they're not allowing group meetings now because of COVID-19. So the workshop's been meeting on Zoom and it's been really successful and wonderful. Without further ado, I would like to go ahead and start our reading today. There's a few things I want to tell you all about. One thing is that when we meet in the workshop, we read what we just wrote to each other. And sometimes we feel inclined to qualify what we're about to read or explain things or share how we're feeling about something or what we've experienced during the writing. And oftentimes these things are just excuses that prevent us from really getting into the work. So everyone in the workshop is allowed three excuses before they read. So if you guys want to use your excuses up today, that's fine. But remember, you're going to have to read anyway. Another thing I want to say is that the workshop has changed over the years. At the beginning of the workshop, everyone who was in the workshop was HIV positive and was dealing with AIDS. The AIDS crisis has changed and so is the workshop. The workshop is now open to people who are HIV negative, HIV positive, people on PrEP, people who are affected and infected by living in a world that affects us. The work that we did during the AIDS crisis has been modeled into um, a creative writing exp experience now that helps us deal with all of the circumstances of stigma, oppression, and um, cultural prejudices that we deal with and helps us to sort through the personal stories of our lives and grow through creative expression. Our first piece today is written by uh, the wonderful Pamela Dunlop. Unfortunately, Pamela cannot be with us today, but a member of our workshop, Tanya Young, has um, volunteered or been asked and agreed to <laughs> uh, read <laughs> Pamela's piece today. Thank you. Thanks, John. My name is Tanya Young, and I'm reading The Fire by Pamela Dunlop. Bullseye, like a cattle prod in the center of the forehead, direct and heartless, cruel and unnecessary, an aim as clean and unsparing as a critic's tongue, the language and intention of a disgusted lover, a lover whose ardor has melted to an oozing puddle, neglected and abandoned, and then struck dead center, just for good measure. In case you hadn't noticed, you have gone from shiny and adored to repellent and ugly. In the blinking of a very little amount of time, you have passed through the gates and been shuttered out the back door onto the rubbish heap. You are a calico no more. Your ruffles are wilted and they shun you, expunge you, would love to see you hung from a ceiling or a bridge. Here it comes, screaming through the air, breaking the sound barrier, breaking your heart, breaking down the back door, the boots clattering on your freshly scrubbed tiles, reaching for you, grasping, grabbing, laughing at you, stealing your face and sending it out on the wires, holding you aloft, Mocking, shaming you, such a pity. 
such a sparkling, glittering bijou, now no more. Deplorable, old, beset with scabs and mold, whimpering, begging. No more glory for you, only silence and darkness. Like an arrow, they pursue you. Like a bullseye, you are marked. Don't breathe, they will hear. Stay in the closet, have them pass you before you move. Be still, be gone, be dead. When this is over, you may eat cake and swim in the ocean. Miranda will hold the towel for you and your slippers will feel so soft and lovely on your feet. But now, for now, until a silence, a receding, an erasing, a death. There is nothing more to say. Cattle are slowly moving across the meadows and farmers are sharpening sieves. Streams overrun their banks. The world is in a grip of a force of ogres and you must not move with the legion. Use a cape, always use a cape and tie your pouch to your waist with a biscuit in it. Thank you, Tanya. Well done. You served Pamela well. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. The Zoom opportunity has allowed us to open the workshop to people from far and wide. Pamela is from New York, so it's wonderful to have someone uh, from New York get to participate. And we also have someone from the Russian River area with us. And I would like to introduce you to Al Adramovich. Al's piece is titled New Jersey, the Garden State of Good and Evil. Al Adramovich here, and I will be reading an original piece, New Jersey, The Garden State of Good and Evil. I'm not an evil person, but I'm a survivor who saw a real horror show growing up. I was raised in middle-class central Jersey by a clinically depressed Jewish mom who was hospitalized for a nervous breakdown when I was six. Although mom was not cognizant of her mental illness, her only real desire was to have a loving and normal family. Ironically, there was nothing normal about my birth since I was delivered on my mom's 30th birthday and she already shared that with her identical twin. The three of us shared this weird psychodramatical birthday connection, not quite an unholy trinity, but nearly a Bermuda Triangle of evil. Everything was done for show. We could, so we could prove that evil was just normal, like the weather. Having bad genes did not make us evil. It only justified doing evil things for attention, for dramatics, and for show. My show was fueled by a desire to work off that genetically coded evil in my DNA double helix. If mental illness is handed down through genes, damn. I got a shitload of it. Call us crazy or more politely cray cray, but our drama could not live within the airtight walls of a vacuum. We needed an audience to make it real. Our extended family and our friends were our horrified audience. I always assumed my mom's twin had received most of my evilness, most of our evilness, but I was wrong. My aunt's evilness was only more visible with her delusions of paranoia and fairness. Al, wash your hands after pooping or you'll get pinworms. Or by weighing out four ounce portions of cooked meat at the dinner table using a scale. My mom's evilness was cloaked with compassion she sparked when cooking, cleaning, or playing house. In rage, she would yell, Al, I'm going to crack you one, hitting her forearm over my skull. And then she'd cry, ow, oh, look what you made me do. I fortunately was only half evil. Finding that perfect balance between good and evil was my superpower. Yes, at age 10, this mama's boy sang next to mom in temple choir, like an angel. But by age 15, I faked a mommy dearest teen, accusing mom of grazing me with a knife so she could get taken away to the loony bin. 
I merely recreated a cinema scene to escape from a crazy home run by a batshit crazy martyr who controlled the horror show. When my dad returned from work, he'd ask, how are things at the home front? Knowing what war was like on the front lines. Yes, childhood was a real thriller, but every line I uttered, both good and evil, was e deeply intertwined in the DNA of genetic code which ran through every cell of my body. How could I be both angelic and satanic at the same time and keep my audience on the edge of their seats? Stay tuned. Thank you, Al, very much. Well done. Uh, this is Al's first season in the workshop. We're really happy to have you, it's wonderful. And we are going to hear next from Alice Turk, Eric McNanty, who's going to read a piece titled Steps to Eternity. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alice Turk, Eric McNanty, and uh, the name of my piece is Steps to Eternity that was inspired by a prompt from our wonderful workshop this season. Um, it's so inspired me that me and my uh, production partner, um, because it's only one scene and one character, are trying to work it into a short film. Okay, I hope you enjoy it. It's kind of depressing, but here we go. Okay. The man sat in front of a blank television screen waiting for something to happen. He knew this day was coming. Everyone did. But everyone else had all chosen to ignore it. Just weeks before, the election from hell had put the ludicrous demon back on the seat of his self-proclaimed throne in the Oval Office of the White House for a second term. The previous four years had seen the country descend, little by little, into a broken, deconstructed mess of lies, greed, racism, and violence. Day by day, the orange beast had playfully whittled his nation down, dividing it against itself with hate that was so toxic, it was more rancid than the poisonous air he knew was heading his way. And then finally there was the disease, the virus, or the Chinese disease. It had come out of nowhere rolling through the world's population with such a deadly speed that by October, it had wiped out millions in a way no one had ever thought possible. The demon had joyously used the virus to foul alliances between countries and cause chaos and death among his own people. Then smugly, he sat back on his throne and grinned his deadly orange grin. Yes, the man knew this day was coming, everyone did, but they had made their own choice to pretend life would somehow return to normal. He, on the other hand, knew that normal would never return and had chosen to prepare for the inevitable. Now the man sat staring at a blank television screen. How long ago was it? An hour? Two hours? Yesterday? The show he'd been watching had suddenly cut out and was replaced with the screech of a public broadcasting siren, and then the screen had gone dark. At first, he wasn't sure what had happened, but then, with a cold dread, he knew. It was the inevitable. It had finally and really come. He gotten up off the couch with Gus, his old dog, following. He'd intended to look out the sliding doors of the balcony towards Los Angeles in the south when the room suddenly began to fill with a blinding white light. Knowing what was about to happen, he dropped to the floor, pulled Gus's head next to his and covered their eyes with his arms. Then everything on the side of the A-frame that faced Los Angeles exploded inwards. He and his pup were thrown backwards through the air and all went black. When he awoke, Gus was whimpering and licking his face. He reached up and took the old boy by his haunches and pulled him down next to him, held him tightly and cried. He could smell burning in the air and he wondered how close the flames were to the mountainside. His common sense told him he should get up and do something constructive. But his mind said, why? What difference does it make now? Rolling over, he crawled back to the couch, pulled himself up onto the cushions and lay down. Gus jumped up beside him, 
and laying down, nestled his shaggy muzzle into the crook of the man's neck. For a long while, the man stared at the ceiling, feeling the hound's breath on his face and thought about the stupidity of it all. Why at 67 had he so desperately worried about survival? All the preparations he'd made, the storeroom full of provisions, all that survival gear, why? He was just going to die alone and of what? Radiation poisoning, a heart attack? There was no one around to help him if he needed help. No one around to even care if he died. Everyone he loved or cared about had stayed back in the city. They were all dead now. Why hadn't he stayed with them? Why hadn't he been there to hold their hands or hug them before disappearing with them in an instantaneous, instantaneous fiery flash? His body hurt as he lifted himself off the couch. He took Gus's head between his hands and kissed his sloppy wet nose, then turned and walked into the bathroom. Opening the medicine cabinet, he took out a large plastic brown bottle filled with an odd mix of pills he'd saved over the years. As he closed the door, he looked at his reflection in the mirror for the last time, then painfully shuffled out and down the hallway. He opened the kitchen's swinging doors. The room was in a shambles from the impact blast. Anything that could break had broken. He picked his way through the wreckage to the refrigerator. Its doors had been blown off its hinges. Reaching into the dark, warm interior, he pulled out a hunk of cheese. He'd wrap a few pills in this for Gus. Turning, he cast his eyes down and looked down at the debris on the floor until he spotted a half-empty bottle of Jack Daniels laying on its side. With great effort, he bent over and picked it up. Closing his eyes, he straightened up and let out a sigh. Then lifted his head, he looked over at the kitchen door. How many steps does it take to reach eternity, he thought to himself. Then putting one foot in front of the other, he began his final journey back to the living room. Thank you. Thank you, Turk. That was astounding. Really beautiful. Our next reader is Sherry Rose, and Sherry is going to read a piece titled Sherry's Resurrection. Hi. Um, this is part of a, an autobiography that I've been attempting to write. So part of it was written a little bit before, and there's a postscript to it as well. I had a massive heart attack in June 2018. I hadn't been feeling well for several weeks. I had a dull pressure in the middle of my chest. It felt like an, like an animal, maybe a large cat, was lying on me. Uncomfortable, but not alarming. It got so I wasn't comfortable lying down or sitting up. I made an appointment with a ge geriatric doctor at UCLA. I explained my symptoms and was given an EKG, which was deemed normal. The doctor prescribed Zantac, medicine for heartburn. I told her that I had never had heartburn, but she just told me, take the medicine and see how I felt. So dutifully, I filled the prescription and went home. I took it for a few days, but no relief. I spent the weekend at my daughter Jen's house, even though I wasn't feeling up to par. I told her about the pain, but she didn't seem very concerned. We saw two depressing films and I went home. I was worried because the pain was constant and I was very uncomfortable. On Wednesday morning, I called 911 and told them I needed an ambulance. The EMT was very nice and cute. And I told him my symptoms. That's the last thing I remember until I woke up three days later in the ICU connected to tubes, my left leg blackened with bruises. My son Matt and my daughter Jen were by my side. They told me that I had had surgery. A stent was inserted in my chest and I was put into an induced coma. Emergency surgery saved my life. Talk about a rude awakening. I felt like the same person, luckily or not, my brain hadn't been affected and I had literally been brought back from the dead. 
I had a tube in my nose and I wasn't able to eat or drink for several weeks. I was allowed 10 ice chips an hour. How I craved the only thing I could swallow. Matt took over letting everyone know, um, thank Mark Zuckerberg for Facebook, what had occurred. I started receiving a steady stream of visitors. I couldn't talk very well. I was basically bedridden, but I was amazed at the number of people who showed up. I guess it takes a near fatal heart attack to get a clear view of one's mortality. I was truly humbled by my friend's devotion. I wasn't allowed to leave the hospital until I passed the swallow test. I had a small camera put down my throat to check if my esophagus was functioning. I suffered some damage from the procedure. Finally, I had to swallow some liquid and I was x-rayed to make sure that I had healed. Next phase, rehab. I was taken to Berkeley East, a beautiful facility in Santa Monica, complete with a rooftop view of the Pacific Ocean. There became, began an onslaught of friends and the number and variety that facility had never seen before. I liked the place so much, I thoroughly enjoyed my 20 days there and was sorry to have to return to my previous life. I spent the next two weeks at Jen's with my, with my granddaughter, Daniela, while she was away at camp. Then sadly, I went back home to the trailer, a place I never wanted to have to return. So here I am back where I started, only with a broken heart and wondering what to do with what's left of my life. When you come back from death, your perspective changes, mortality looms large. I have an enormous empathy for Martin O'Brien, my performance partner who suffers from cystic fibrosis, and of course, my late husband, Bob Flanagan. I was always the healthy one. They were the, they were the identified sick ones. Now I'm the patient and I have to learn patience and figure out where the fuck I'm going and what the fuck I'm going to do, postscript. Now, because of COVID-19, everyone knows how it feels to be sick. Everyone is suspect. Every cough bodes disease and death. We are quarantined in our homes, no longer allowed to go to restaurants, movies, museums, or any cultural events. Martin wrote a book, Survival of the Sickest, and sadly, that has come to pass. Ironically, those of us who have had prior experience with social isolation due to medical issues understand only too well the psychic damage we all have now have to endure. Beautiful. Thank you, Sherry. That was really fantastic. We are going to now hear from Kirk Wilson, and Kirk's going to read a piece titled The Cornfield Chronicles. Hi, um, this is a piece titled The Cornfield Chronicles. In the beginning, there was corn. There was also a fair bit of alfalfa, summer wheat, rye, and soybeans, to be honest. But mainly, all you could see because of its great height was corn. A quaint country chapel and a stately old farmhouse stood in dark Frank, and stood in stark frankness against the corn, which of course belonged to my grandparents, Doris and Dallas, and was where we all lived. Watching the fields plowed and tilled until the dirt was dark at night. Wake in wonder mere days later, witnessing thousands of bright green frog-like tongues breaking through the mounded earth. Each morning, awakening to three more inches, sometimes four, overnight. Dallas swore it grew at least a quarter of an inch during his daily nap. Days were spent by his side, driving recklessly in an old army jeep that served as our tank and armor, flying through the stalks, spewing dust and rocks. A gravel pit served as our swimming hole, and in the summer and our skating rink in the winter. It was the source of much fear and mystery. Stores my, stories about what might be down there kept me awake at night, that and the darkness. There is nothing darker than a farm in the middle of northeastern Indiana. There isn't. Even in the desert, it's never as dark because of the stars. 
in the Midwest, the sky eats the stars. You never really get to see them the way they are. The farm was my sanctuary. Worlds were discovered and explored. Barns were cathedrals. Hogs were monsters from some pork infested world. Chicken smelled like shit and stupidly bit my ankles. Suddenly, and almost magically, eggs would appear. How did that happen? Plop. That's how. Jingle Bells, the cat, would die needing to be gently nudged with a stick to make sure she was dead. Yep, she's dead. You seldom found a deceased pet on a farm, mainly because there was nothing left to see. We burned trash in an old oil drum. I was never allowed to burn the garbage when the wind was blowing down towards the clothesline. That wasn't too, that wasn't too often, so that was okay. The big old house had a fruit cellar, pretty funny because we never really ate much fruit. Apples and strawberries are about all I remember. Pears, maybe. Is rhubarb a fruit? Lots of rhubarb. We did, however, can and freeze corn. It was a seasonal production line that includes the entire clan working to store enough home, to store enough home grown corn to last through the long Midwest winters. And it did. We put some of it in old mason jars and the rest in the big deep freeze that lived in the basement next to the ping pong table that grandma used to sort and fold laundry. In those days, Tide, Tide came in a box the size of a suitcase. 16,000 years ago, Indiana, buried at the foot of giant glaciers, part of the tremendous Plasticine epoch, or as most Hoosiers referred to as the Great Ice Age. Beneath all that corn was glacial till, excellent soil deposits, and a unique training system because of the mixture of gravel and stone left behind from the giant icebergs. Later arrived indigenous Indians, which is where the name came from, the land of Indians. Indiana was sitting surrounded by Kettle Lakes at the crossroads of what would later become America. It was common to find bits and pieces of artifacts while playing in surrounded fields and woods. Arrowheads, bits of bone, Local tribes learned over time to bury their dead high in treetops. Hence, as to not have to suffer from burial sites desecration, torn continuously up and destroyed by the newly arriving Dutch and German farmers set on claiming ways of life, most notably known for the South. Tippecanoe, Wawasi, Papakichi. The great names were everywhere to the point that no one ever really gave it much thought. Indians had been hunting mastodons 8,000 years before the first Dairy Queen came to town. It was easy imagining the great Miami chief setting traps for food or shooting arrows while running through the thick woods that run alongside lush green creeks and riverbeds that divided the fields and townships. Hunting was part of growing up, although I never had much of a stomach for it. My first outing was an early frigid winter deep with the snow, the cornfields buried in the stuff. Rickety fences would paint black strokes on the horizon against the white. Where are we going, I asked. Why, it's fox season, he said. We lost two hens just this morning. And off we went with a, with a rifle under Dallas's arm, flying briskly, ice dripping from my nose, crashing through the field in the old Jeep headed for a significant drift left by the wind and bales of hay that had not yet fed the livestock. There's a nest in there, see those tracks? Sure enough, little paw prints crunched through the crust, 
form in a straight line south towards the old country road. I saw a blur of fox red fur and then kaboom from his rifle blasting my eardrums, causing me to miss his hit. I must have left, I must have left, <laughs> I must have let out one of my famous girly ass screams because Dallas never asked me hunting again. Thank you, Kirk. And we are going to hear from Nancy Sorto next. The title of Nancy's piece is Las Toxicas. Whenever you're ready, Nancy. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so my piece is titled Las, Box Las Toxicas. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you're never going to believe what happened. Meet me at the Nowhere Bar at 6 p.m. I can't tell you guys through text. I think I fucked up. Natalie texted Ceci, Rosie, and Myra in the group chat named Group Therapy Sesh with Las Toxicas on Instagram. Natalie showed up at the bar at 5.30 to down a shot or two before her friend showed up. She was nervous. What would her friends think? Never mind that. How will her friends even be able to help her out of this mess? Can I have a shot of tequila? Natalie asked the bartender. That'll be $12. Do you want to start a tab? Um, yeah, that's fine. The bartender turned around to get her tab started, then poured a shot and handed it to Natalie. She downed the shot immediately and took a deep breath. Then she heard the door open and turned around and Ceci and Rosie were walking in. Natalie waved half-heartedly. She looks exhausted, Ceci whispered to Rosie. Rosie nodded in agreement. Natalie was exhausted. She hadn't slept all night reliving the interaction that she had with the officer, asking herself why she chose to park on the Holland in broad daylight. Ceci and Rosie sat down on each side of Natalie. Hey babe, how are you? Rosie asked. Meh, asked Natalie. Myra walked in and came up behind Natalie and gave her a hug. We should get a table, Myra suggested, then walked over to the table and sat down. Okay, what's going on? asked Myra. Then there's a break in the story and um, Natalie explains what happened. Fuck, 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 Natalie said hastily as she got off of James' laps. She shuffled to put her pants on and before James registered what was happening, he heard a knock on the car window next to him. He quickly adjusted his pants and then rolled down the window. Hi officer, how can I get your license and registration? Yeah, yeah, of course. James reached over to the dashboard and pulled out the registration and handed it to the officer. You know you can't be parked here, right? This is a permit only area. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I didn't notice, James stuttered. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give you a parking ticket. Natalie was sitting in the passenger seat avoiding eye contact with the officer. How old are you two? 27, said James, 25, said Natalie. You're old enough to know better than to be having sex in a car. Don't you have anywhere else to go? Um, uh, Natalie didn't know how to respond. This is absurd. Both of you, give me your IDs. I'm citing you for indecent exposure. They handed him their IDs and he took them and walked back to his patrol car. What the fuck, James? Natalie exclaimed. What? How was I supposed to know this was going to happen? I told you we could get a room at a motel and you said no because this would be more exciting. But you agreed. I didn't drag you out here. Shh, shh. The cop's coming back. Here are your IDs the officer said as he handed their IDs and citations back to James. You'll get more information about your court date in the mail. What? What does this mean? Natalie asked nervously. What's going to happen? Not my problem, said the officer. Then he drove off. Let's get out of here. Do you want me to take you home, said James. Natalie nodded without saying a word. Excuse me. Um, now it cuts back to the scene at the bar. Holy shit said Myra. What are you going to do? Did you call a lawyer? asked Ceci. Yeah, I did. Uh, they said that I could get charged with indecent exposure, which is a sex offense. And if I get convicted, then I have to be put on the sex offender registry, Natalie explained. Fuck, seriously? Just for fucking in the car? Myra asked. Yeah, apparently, Natalie said. I'm sure we can get you out of this, Natalie. I know it's scary, but I'm sure they can make a case that it's not something that serious that requires you to go on the sex offenders registry, Rosie said. Why were you guys in the car anyways? Spicing up the marriage? Asked Ceci. Um, yeah, about that, Natalie said nervously. This is what I didn't want to tell you guys over text. It wasn't with Brandon. It was with James, my ex James. The girls went silent. 
The girls knew how Natalie was and her cheating on her husband was nothing new, but fucking James again was not something they expected. Look, yeah, I know it sounds bad, but can you guys not judge me right now? I need help, said Natalie. Yeah, okay, said Myra. We're here for you. Is there anything else we can help you out with? Asked Rosie. Yeah, I need you guys to help me get this letter, the notice about my charges. We need to get it from my mailbox before Brandon finds it. He can't find out about this. We can check your mailbox for you and just pick it up before Brandon finds it, said Rosie. Oh my God, yes, I can make copies of the mail key and give them to you, said Natalie. Do you know what time your mailman comes by? No, but I'll start stalking him and find out. The girls laughed. Okay, then it's set. Mission Intersect the Mailman begins tomorrow. But for now, let's order some more drinks, said Ceci. This round's on me. I owe you guys, said Natalie. Yeah, you do, said Rosie. Thank you so much, Nancy. It's great to see you on here. Yeah. And next, we have a reading by Mark Jordan. And the title of Mark's piece is I Miss. My name is Mark Jordan, and uh, I've been uh, doing a workshop for now, I guess, about three years now, two years. Um, and uh, I enjoy it a lot, other than these public readings. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just the other day, I was lonely, and yes, horny too. So. Pornhub just showed up on my computer. I don't know how, it just showed up. I skipped the one about the eight guys in the hotel room. I did mark it for later to watch. I found one of a guy in a jock in his car. It looked hot, so I reached over to the nightstand and got out the lube and the poppers and began to watch. Mr. Carr started to play, and then some other guy was walking around the outside of his car, but I noticed the windows were of the car was all rolled up. I thought, well, this isn't going to be any fun. Finally, Mr. Carr rolled down the windows and got on his knees and turned around, and the guy rolled down, or and the guy outside started to play and caress Mr. Carr's ass rubbing down one leg and then the other and tickling a spot in between the legs well i didn't need to know how the how it ended as i laid laid there in my afterglow in bed thinking about it i realized it was all about the touch i miss a man in my bed to cuddle. I miss not being able to spread eagle from corner to corner because someone's sleeping next to me. I miss thinking about having to make breakfast for two in the morning. I miss not sleeping because I'm not used to hearing someone breathe next to me. I miss changing the sheets three days after he's gone because his smell has finally dissipated. I also miss going through his pants when he's in the bathroom to find out what his name is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That was great. All right, we are going to hear next from Stephen Milliken. Hi, I'm Steve Milliken, and I'll be reading an excerpt from a longer piece entitled my Rocky Horror Virginity Show. I remember when I lost my vaginal virginity in 1979. I hadn't yet convinced myself I wasn't straight, but perhaps gay adjacent. And it had been a goal of mine to catch up at 25 years old and finally be able to say, of course I'm not a virgin. I get stuff done. What with my oppressive Catholic upbringing, I had only recently learned to masturbate six months earlier at the tender age of 24, so I was on fire with sexual progress. Linda had severely permed, frizzy hair bleached to a brutally brassy tone. Her smile was harshly unique as she used bright red lipstick bordered with black lip liner, which emphasized this large gap between her two front teeth which produced a sibilant whistling tone to her speech. 
Her eyes were enhanced by black eyeliner, black eyeshadow, and she penciled in her arched eyebrows, which gave her a perpetual expression of suspense and high alert. Her clothing was limited to various shades of dark Gothic tones to complete her singular harrowing look. I met Linda at a beginning acting class at Santa Monica Community College. We were cast in a one act play by George Bernard Shaw. We were fiancés in the one act production and apparently she took it to the next level and fell in love with me in real life. The method has its merits. I thought it prudently wise to choose Linda as my first heterosexual conquest because she worked in a massage parlor that specialized in heterosexual happy endings. Even though I wasn't really attracted to her, who better to gain experience from than a bona fide professional in my field of endeavor? The rigors of the play lay behind us, so I decided to take the fatal plunge and dive into the virgin waters of sexual experience by asking Linda for a date. She was thrilled to hear from me and asked if I could pick her up at work since her car was at Al's auto body experience and she'd need a ride home from the massage parlor. On the drive home to her apartment, I asked how her day had been. Oh, it was so simple. Really, just run of the mill. I only had to give five blowjobs. Oh, that's nice. However, I really didn't know how that could be just run of the mill, but maybe I didn't know that much about running mills either. Her studio apartment was decorated like the movie, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, including black blood dripping from the top of each wall, beginning where it met at the ceiling, and down the walls throughout the small studio apartment. The wall inside the dinette featured a large pair of bright red plastic lips from the movie, the upper teeth sensually biting the lower lip. The front and rear windows of her studio apartment were decorated with black satin curtains festooned with a jutting fringe of black feathers. The walls were further embellished with framed stills from the movie. One of them was a headshot of Tim Curry as Dr. Frankenfurter. It had an eerie effect of seemingly watching you wherever you were in the small apartment. While I didn't see a bed anywhere, there were two wide black folding closet double doors accented with painted red blood dripping down each of them. They concealed a Murphy bed. Upon opening the doors, the bed came crashing down as if it robustly resented its confinement, not unlike my virginity. She inserted an audio cassette of the movie soundtrack into her tape player and fast forwarded it to touch a touch a touch me. She really knew how to set the mood. My Rocky Horror Show virginity was about to be lost. Thank you, Steve. It's great to have you with us here. And our next reader is Steve Keys. My name is Steve Keys and um... I have no excuse. Uh, the title of this piece is Crossing San Vicente. I hate this street. Eight lanes, it's like braving the Audubon. These drivers never stop. It was true, you could be standing in the middle of traffic with racing flags and it wouldn't matter. This San Vicente, I hate it, fucking LA. My friend Larry and I were heading over to a diner for some big news. Larry was prone to gushing, seemed ready to burst. You're never going to believe what happened. Okay, well, tell me. I'm engaged. I didn't even know he was seeing anyone. You've been dating somebody? Yeah, I kept it on the down low because I didn't want anyone to know in case it didn't work out. But it did, and I am. We took a table near the window and I could barely feign surprise since Larry went through men like Kleenex. This was the sixth time in as many years that he'd become engaged. So you're engaged, again. <laughs> well, that's great. When do I meet him? Larry squinted and paused. You mean in person? Uh, yeah. Well, that's the funny thing. Uh-huh. I adjusted my tacky diner chair in anticipation of the big reveal. That's the funny thing. Uh, we met online. He's in France, so there's that. 
we've never really met, you know, in person. And you're engaged in what? Larry rolled his eyes, took a slurp of coffee and an angry pause. You're always so suspicious, engaged, you know, like to be married, but you've never met. Not in person, but the online sex is great. The best I've ever had. I come just when he says hello, you know, in French. So when's the big day? We haven't decided. He's waiting for his mother to die. She's 98, then he gets the money. Now, neither Larry or myself were kids anymore, but he was as starry-eyed as a 16-year-old when it came to dating. Every guy was the one. I don't mean to be a party pooper, but this is like the sixth time you've been engaged since I've known you. The fifth, so you're wrong, and you are a party pooper. There's a couple almost that I never mentioned because you're kind of judgmental, picky. I mean, when's the last time you saw anybody more than twice? I was not picky. I am not picky. Fussy. I am not fussy. Please, the last time we went to dinner, you sent back the water. That's an old joke. Well, it's true. The glass had a smudge. Larry lifted himself into high dudgeon and raised his glass, peering through the ice water. Picky, picky. I'm certainly not as promiscuous as you, that's for sure. He paused for dramatic effect. I am not promiscuous. I'm tactile. Well, I'm happy for you, but I don't have your temperament. And I sure wouldn't feel comfortable having any kind of relationship with someone I'd never met in France online. <laughs> I mean, I can't even cut and paste. Larry thumped me on the forehead. You're such a Luddite. If you'd upgrade from that Fisher Price piece of shit you call a laptop, you might get a little more action. I added another spoon of sugar to my cup. I'm fine. I don't need sex the way you apparently do. What do you mean, apparently? I'm a normal, healthy, 35-year-old gay man. Larry hadn't seen 35 in at least 10 years. 35, is that what you told the guy in France? I'm well preserved and I adjust the lighting, so who cares? Yeah, well, good luck. I'm glad you're happy. Happy, I'm ecstatic. What's better than wet, hot sex? Who cares where it is? If it gets any wetter, I'll have to install a splash guard on my iPad. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Excellent. I think uh, we could market those in the workshop. We'll, we should talk about that later. All right, and our next and final piece of writing today is going to be coming from Tanya Young, and the piece is titled, Got BLM? Hi, I'm Tanya Young, and I love the HIV Writers Workshop. And it's a great resource that I continue to enjoy. What's important to me is the truth of our policing system. I have participated in our American policing system, gotten tickets, restraining orders, accident reports, gotten arrested. That is, dated a police officer and was gifted a shield to wear as a necklace as a get out of jail free card. As an actress, I am cast in the middle of so-called copaganda, shows and movies that portray police as good guys, earnest, honest, and effective crime busters. The reality is that the majority of crimes go not only unpunished, but unsolved, and that some crimes are committed by a fraction of police officers. Without our shared illusions about policing, there would not be both well-funded police forces, but also endless permutations of cold case, forensic files, and the latest docu-victim of the Tiger King and Carol Baskin. Philosopher Paul Michel Foucault said the relationship between power and knowledge is a form of social control through institutions. The truth of this is evident in the institution of modern American policing. Cops from the United Kingdom to Japan to Sweden 
do not routinely carry firearms on their daily beat. Consequently, gun violence and murder by cop in those countries are rare. So complete is our American ignorance of how this works, I can't even be certain it's really true. My American understanding of the police is that they carry weapons to keep the peace and to enforce the law. I think that work is done well and in earnest some of the time. But I'm overwhelmed by the images of police shooting Americans in the back, killing dogs through fences and choking people to death with their knees and their hands. These murders are so called because they are blatant violations of human rights. Attending Black Lives Matter protests, I learned that over 620 people were murdered by police, sheriffs, and transit officers in Southern California, and that Los Angeles has the most murderous police force in the world. That's a matter of statistics as dry as the bones, blood, and tear gas powder anointing our streets. Victims get killed mistakenly. Blood Victims get killed mistakenly, shot in a moment of officer panic through the window of a moving police car or by aggressive repeat tasing. I am not educated in criminal justice. I know people who hoofed it over to John Jay College on Manhattan's west side to get a degree in it. Maybe they learned about concepts I only ever heard about because of standing around in the hot sun at Black Lives Matter rallies where I was actually trying to help get my friends laid. Everyone is thirsty in the midst of a socially distanced quarantine. But social justice warriors like me are even more thirsty for ending so-called qualified immunity. Who knew cops are not liable for on-the-job murder because of a 1969 law? Not always, not necessarily, just since 1969. People drive cars older than that law. Imagine the reduction in fatal mistakes if cops had to carry their own insurance, like doctors or Uber and Lyft drivers. We have options, people. Standing outside in a chic streetwear protest outfit, holding a clever police reform now sign has been, dare I say it, surprisingly fun. At the downtown Los Angeles Hall of Justice where District Attorney Jackie Lacey has offices and staff, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles is led by Patrice Cullors and her non-binary partner, Janaya Future Khan. Joining and leading the weekly protest for the last three years is actor Kendrick Sampson's Build Power Group that advocates for racial justice in Hollywood. Together, Black, White, Native American, Latinx, Asian, we shout, chant down Babylon, Black people are the bomb, we ready. Fuck Garcetti. Oh, the joy of gathering, masked and socially distanced to scream at the top of our lungs for justice. We shout so loud you can hear your own voice echo off the court buildings. The sheriffs cock their rifles, LAPD rests palms on holstered Glock 19s, and, ho and Homeland Security lobs tear gas canisters. While we defy them with our voices, our delicate human flesh, and our thirst for social justice. We return tear gas canisters with hockey sticks and answer hatred with hope. But before I went to rally for Black Lives Matter, I had no idea about ending qualified immunity and the sole financial liability of municipalities. And my ignorance, like yours, is by design. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Tanya. Really fantastic. That was wonderful, everyone. I'm really moved by the strength and the character that you all uh, have shown today. You know, we've had wonderful stories about everything from love to mental illness to politics and suicide and mortality and family and sex and learning and growing and changing. I think that you all have mapped out a wonderful piece of the human existence for everyone to share today. Um, I'm really proud of how all of you have stepped up to the plate during COVID and continued to keep the workshop going. We didn't know what it was like not meeting in person. And um, I can only attest that you all 
did just a wonderful job holding the workshop together this year during this time. If you would like to participate in the HIV Writers Workshop, you can email us at hivwritersworkshop at gmail.com. I'm really grateful again to the Department of Cultural Affairs, the California Men's Gathering, Cedar sinai I also want to share gratitude to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence because every year since I've taken over the workshop, we have a ritual that we do where the sisters come and hold space at the public reading and we read the names of all the people who have been in the workshop who have died in commemoration of all the people who have come before us in the workshop and the work the sisters do and also all the people who have died and are suffering during COVID, I would like us all just to have a little moment of silence here. I'm gonna ring a chime for a moment of silence. So take that with you into the rest of your day. Thank you to everyone who's come watched us today. Thanks for coming to the Writer's Workshop reading. Bye everyone.